Hello, and uh, welcome to our Voyagers Travel Discussion Club, where we are going to be talking about our, a trip to Seattle tonight. Uh, my name is Susan McBride, and I'm joined with my colleague, Mike Edding. Hello. And we're going to work our way through, uh, a, you know, a four or five day itinerary uh, of Seattle. Um, Seattle was nicknamed the Emerald City back in the 1980s as a result of a contest. And it was designated um, that way to allude to the lush evergreen trees in the surrounding area of Seattle. You can easily entertain yourself in a three or four day trip to Seattle, but if you have more time, you will be able to explore some of the surrounding areas that are well worth exploring as well. There are a couple of things worth noting. First, Seattle is notorious for its rain. Um, most of the measurable precipitation in Seattle does come in the form of drizzle and light rain, um, but you can expect rain on about 150 days a year. This is primarily due to the weather fronts having difficulty getting past the Cascade Mountain ranges, and that causes a lot of clouds and a lot of rain. But compared with Chicago, where it rains on average about 125 days, um, it's, you know, it's not that much more. Tonight, we're going to begin exploring some of the more touristy areas downtown, um, Belltown, Downtown, Pioneer Square, and International District. And then we're going to move into some of the more notable neighborhoods that would be worth exploring. Um, there are numerous day trips from Seattle that are also worth taking if you have the time, including a trip to Bainbridge Island, Snoqualmie Falls, and Mount Rainier National Park. But unfortunately, uh, because there's so much to do in the city proper, we're not going to be delving into those, but I wanted to make mention of them so that if you do get a chance to go to Seattle, you might want to check those out. So we're going to start in the area known as Belltown. Um, Seattle Center right here is located in Belltown, and it's the area just north and west of the main downtown section of Seattle. Uh, this is where you're going to find some of the most popular tourist areas and a great place to start your visit. Seattle Center includes the Space Needle, the Chihuly Glass Museum, the Museum of Pop Culture, the, and the Gates Discovery Center. There's also a beautiful outdoor area um, that surrounds all of these structures as well, and a food hall that is located in the Armory building where you can get all sorts of goodies to eat. You can also access the Seattle Center here to the downtown area by way of a monorail, so it's very, very convenient. So let's start with the Space Needle. It is unquestionably the most iconic landmark in Seattle. If you've seen a picture of Seattle, then you've seen the Space Needle most likely. It was built in 1962 for the World's Fair, and it is a symbol of the city. It's the most visited attraction in Seattle. At the time that it was erected, it was the tallest structure west of the Mississippi. The tower has a saucer at the top, and it's about 520 feet uh, um, above ground. It offers Seattle's visitors the only 360 degree indoor and outdoor views of downtown. You can see Mount Rainier, you can see the Puget Sound, and you can also see the Cascades and the Olympic Mountain Ranges off in the distance. Um, tickets for the Space Needle range between 27 and 37 per person, depending on your age and what time of day you visit. It's cheapest to visit between 10 and 11, which is true of all of the sites in the Seattle Center. Um, and then for a unique dining experience, if you see this picture that I tucked in here underneath the Space Needle, um, you can go to the Loop Lounge. And that is has a glass floor, so you can see all the way down to the ground. It is one flight of stairs below the main observation deck at the top saucer. And you can sit there and have um, drinks and tastes of the Pacific Northwest, and it rotates um, as, as you're sitting there. So it's a pretty neat way to see the city. 
Right in the shadow of the Space Needle, you're also going to find the Chihuly Glass Museum and Garden. So just a little background. Uh, glass artist Dale Chihuly was born in Tacoma, Washington, and he was introduced to glass while studying interior design at the University of Washington. When he graduated in 1965, he enrolled in the first glass program in the country at the University of Wisconsin. And he continued his studies at um, the Rhode Island School of Design or RISD, where he later established the glass program and taught for more than a decade. Um, he went on to Venice to study um, work at a glass factory. And then that's where he learned um, a, the team approach to blowing glass. And this is critical to the way that he works today, where he works with a team of people as he's blowing glass. Um, so when the Seattle Center was first being developed, the Wright family invited Chihuly to present a comprehensive collection of his work. And um, having always loved the Space Needle, Chihuly was delighted with the opportunity to design an exhibition hall, a garden installation, and a glass house right in his own community. So the museum includes eight different galleries and three drawing walls. And they offer a really comprehensive collection of Dale Chihuly's significant series of work. Um, I, I have to say, whoops, sorry, that this was um, by far, when I visited Seattle, the highlight of my trip. Um, the centerpiece is this glass house. Um, it's a 40 foot tall structure of steel and glass. Um, and you can see um, down the center of it is this 100 foot long sculpture that's in like reds and oranges and yellows. It's made of many individual elements, but altogether it's one of Chihuly's largest suspended sculptures. He has shown his artwork in botanic gardens all over the world, uh, including, I don't know, many years ago, he showed at the Garfield Park Conservatory. Um, but this was his first time in working with a landscape designer to create a space that is unlike any other garden or exhibition elsewhere. So the outdoor garden, um, they developed unique plant collection that it was specifically chosen to complement Julie's work. Um, it is a magical place, the museum and the, the glass garden and uh, definitely worth the visit. Tickets are around $35, but um, you could spend a long time get, uh, going through the galleries. And this is just a taste of what you'll see. Um, the, the outdoor gardens are also spectacular. Just across the Seattle Center from the Chihuly Garden is one of Microsoft founder Paul Allen's greatest contributions to the city. This is the Museum of Pop Culture known as MoPop. It was formerly known as the Experience Music Project. The museum's structure was designed in 2000 by architect Frank Gehry. Um, so it's truly a sight to be seen. The exhibits range in topic and explore a variety of themes from indie video games to horror films to tattoo culture and Marvel superheroes. But one of the highlights of the muse museum are its exhibits on the important Seattle bands such as Nirvana and Pearl Jam. So you'll wanna beat the crowds, um, so come early on a weekday. This is one of the most popular tourist attractions in Seattle. And then just down the way from the Seattle Center is the Olympic Sculpture Park. It is a transformed nine acre industrial site that is open and vibrant and um, a great green space for um, art. It is part of the Seattle Art Museum family. It overlooks both the Puget Sound and the Cascade Mountains and is really one of the most tranquil places in downtown Seattle. It is free, it's open to the public 365 days a year and it has a vast collection of um, wide ranging pieces. The park also occasionally hosts yoga in the garden, so you may want to check that out. Um, you can go online to check the schedule before you go, and you can participate in yoga amongst the sculptures. From there, you'll want to take the monorail um, all the way down to Westfield Center Mall, uh, and it goes on to Fifth Avenue and Pine Street. 
The Westfield Center Mall is the per perfect drop-off point to explore downtown and the waterfront. It is a doable walk, but taking the monorail gives you an elevated view of the city as you make your way downtown. And so in the downtown area, we're gonna talk about um, the, this area right around here. It's um, the Spheres, Pike Place Market, the Seattle Art Museum, and the Seattle Public Library. So the Spheres is a unique structure that was built by Amazon for its employees. Um, the spheres are a result of innovating, innovative thinking about the character of a workplace and an extended conversation about what is typically missing from urban offices, and that is a direct link to nature. So the spheres are home to more than 40,000 plants from the cloud forest regions of over 30 countries. They broke ground on the spheres in 2015, and it was completed um, in 2017. One of the highlights of the spheres is the 4,000 square feet of living walls that contain more than 25,000 plants. Um, they are an innovative demonstration of biodiversity. Uh, and these walls were the brainchild of horticulture program manager, Ben Iben. They assembled the living walls by growing the plants on mesh panels at a greenhouse. And when the panels were ready, they were transported and attached to the growing surface within the spheres. And um, with careful preparation, the teams as assembled the spheres tallest wall in only about two weeks. So you can stroll through the spheres indoor gardens by reservation during the first and third Saturday of each month. They were closed during COVID. I think they're beginning to open up now. So you'll wanna go online if you're in Seattle and see if you can grab a spot because they're definitely worth going in and walking around. Um, otherwise, if you know somebody that works at Amazon, they can also swipe you in. But even if you don't get a spot, um, walking around the exterior and sitting in the courtyard that the spheres create is well worth it. About a 10 minute walk down Stewart Street Hill brings you to one of the other most iconic tourist spots in Seattle, and that would be the Pike Place Market. Pike Place Market was opened in 1907, so that makes it one of the oldest continuously operated farmers markets in the country. It's a thriving community of farmers, street performers, and restaurateurs, but it is more than just a place to grab a bike. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you can check out the underground shops, the bookstores, apothecaries, and even the special magic shop that's within the, the public market. It is a maze of walkways and it's easy to get lost, but it's definitely fun to get lost too because there's so much to see. As you head out of the market, you're gonna notice a line snaking around the first ever Starbucks. The inside is exactly like any other Starbucks. So waiting over 20 minutes, 30 minutes plus to order your latte might be something that you can and probably should want to skip. You can snap a selfie in front of it and move on to one of the other numerous Starbucks throughout the city. There are a few highlights at Pike Place Market that you're gonna wanna keep your eyes out for. First of all, um, one of my favorite shops that I went into was Mesker Maps. It is a map store, but it also has a, an extensive selection of travel books, puzzles, and all sorts of really interesting um, Seattle and Washington Pacific Northwest um, things. It's definitely worth stopping in and wandering. You can spend a lot of time in, the, in that shop. There is a gum wall that is an Instagram favorite. It's literally a walkway or an alleyway where the walls are covered in chewed gum. Some people think it's worth visiting, but truly I didn't think it was worth looking for. And it's really kind of gross. We happened upon it and uh, you know, you, maybe you'll want to see it, but I thought it was kind of gross. Um, in terms of food, there are all sorts of great food stalls at Pike Place Market. Um, a couple that are worth mentioning, um, if you like biscuits, there's a shop called Biscuit Bitch that makes really tasty biscuits. 
There is also a Greek yogurt stand, Elenos, that serves large cups of Greek yogurt with your favorite choice of toppings. Definitely worth the wait. Uh, if you are into cheese, you will definitely want to stand in line at Beecher's Handmade Cheese, where they make the cheese on site. There they have a cafe. You can pick up a grilled cheese sandwich and a tomato soup or a mac and cheese. And then you'll, you'll want to head over to Rachel's Ginger Beer, where they make ultra fresh ginger beer right in Seattle using fresh water, lemons, organic sugar, and ginger. It's super tangy, really refreshing, definitely worth checking out. Just about two blocks from Pike Place Market is another Seattle must try, and that is Top Pot Donuts, the flagship. They're, they're located all over Seattle, but the flagship store is on Fifth Avenue, just up the hill from Pike Place. And if you go, you'll want to try one of their old fashioned donuts, which are available in several different flavors. Finally, on the back side of Pike Place Market is a terrace with tables where you can sit and it overlooks the Seattle waterfront. You can see the Ferris wheel from it. This, this picture was shot from that, the terrace on the back side of the market. Um, and you can see Puget Sound. This is the waterfront. And right now they are doing a ton of construction there. There are big plans for development along the waterfront. There used to be a double-decker highway here and they've cleared that out. And now I think you can see here in the picture, it's just, it's all construction. So when that's done, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to check out the waterfront as well. After you've had your fill of food and good times at Pike Place Market, you can head over to the Seattle Art Museum for a little culture. The Seattle Art Museum or the SAM is one of the largest collections of art in Washington state. And it features a variety of works that range in genre from contemporary to ancient Roman and, and even more. An entry to the permanent collection requires only a suggested donation but special exhibits will cost extra. And um, visitors are offered half price tickets on the first Thursday of every month. So you may wanna schedule that into your visit. And you'll know you're at the art museum when you see this sculpture, his arm, it goes up and down and um, it's an iconic piece of art in front of the Sam. Moving on to the Seattle Public Library. The Seattle Central Library is a striking steel and glass building right in the heart of downtown. It isn't often that the library is considered one of the coolest joints in town, but Seattle's downtown library is such an architectural wonder that it is one of the city's highlights. The building opened in 2004 and its design kind of created a rift among many locals. They either loved it or they hated it. There really wasn't much middle ground with this giant glass cube and its diamond patterned steel girders. It is designed by architect Rem Coolhouse, and it's really an ingenious design because in a town that is known for its gray skies, the library abounds with natural light because of the design. If you need to use the internet, there are hundreds of computer terminals that you can use. You can also tour the building or just find a quiet spot to sit and read a book while resting for the rest of your sightseeing day. From downtown, we're gonna move on to Pioneer Square, which is just a little bit further south. Um, and we're gonna talk about Smith Tower, Waterfall Park, and then the underground tour of Seattle. Pioneer Square is a neighborhood full of beautiful brick buildings and stone buildings. This area of town is full of character and it's considered the birthplace of the city. There are many historic buildings here and it has a real charm to it. It's got a very different feel from the rest of downtown. Pioneer Square was settled in 1852 and then it burned to the ground in 1889. The historic um, buildings are some of the most beautifully restored buildings in the city. There are vibrant art galleries and there are small boutiques. You can grab a coffee. There's literally a coffee shop on every corner 
and just take a meandering walk through this quiet part of Seattle. It's truly one of the most photogenic places in the city. Other than exploring the old and said to be haunted buildings, you can also check out Seattle's famous underground city in Pioneer Square. There is an entire underground city that Seattle was built on top of after the Great Fire of 1889. One tour that you might want to check out is Bill Beatles underground tour that actually takes you below the street level. And um, it, it's really an ideal activity if it's a rainy day, for example, because you're underground and out of the rain. Um, you'll want to remember to wear closed toed shoes on the tour because it does take you through the catacombs of the city. Smith Tower is also located in Pioneer Square. Uh, in 1914, Smith Tower became the first skyscraper in Seattle, and it was the tallest building west of the Mississippi. For more than 100 years, it has remained a cultural icon of the city, and it offers really breathtaking panoramic view and has um, a lot of appeal to those with architectural eyes. You can head up to the observatory on one of the only existing Otis man-operated elevators today. The elevator attendant will be decked out in 1920s period costume. When you get to the observatory, you'll feel like you've gone back in time to the roaring 20s. It's kind of Gatsby-esque. You can walk around the exterior deck and enjoy the incredible views of the city. And from Smith Tower, you get the views of the Space Needle, which you don't get when you're up in the Space Needle, for example. But then you can finish your experience by enjoying one of the amazing cocktails and, and appetizers in a lounge that is um, kind of a 20s style lounge at the top of the building. So while the stunning views are the reason to go to the top of the tower, the food and beverages win really high marks as well. I would pick this experience over the Space Needle time and time again, just because it's so unique. It's not crowded. It's a fraction of the price and it's got a really cool atmosphere. Um, access to the observatory is available from Wednesday until Sunday. So just make note of that. It's open until nine every day, except Friday and Saturday when it's open until 10. And tickets range between 16 and $19. Our last stop in Pioneer Square is the UPS Waterfall Garden. You'll wanna make a point to visit this while you're in Pioneer Square. You can enjoy this beautiful park with the relaxing sounds of rushing water right in the middle of the city. This is the spot where UPS was founded and it's a nice little place to sit and have a coffee and rest while you're walking around Seattle. Um, while you're in the neighborhood, one place you may wanna check out is called Flat Stick Pub. This is a fun little pub bar that has a, a really fun indoor mini golf course that you can enjoy while you're sipping on your beverage, just as a little break from the tourist activities. Then we're gonna to move to the International District in Chinatown, which is just a little bit further down from um, Pioneer Square. The Asian Pacific Americans have played prominent roles in Seattle history from the beginning of the city's settlement. So it therefore only follows that there is unquestionably a significant Asian influence throughout the city. In the international district, it's all about the food from different regions all over Asia. There are too many notable restaurants to name all of them, um, so I'm only going to highlight a few that you might want to check out on your next visit to Seattle. So we'll start here with Mike's Noodle House. It is a quick and inexpensive meal, and it's hard to beat Mike's Noodle House. It's in a tucked away little Chinatown shop with simple flavors, but it's all very incredibly delicious. They serve perfectly cooked noodles and some of the best wontons in the city. 
on a normal weekend, this place can draw lines for takeout. So you'll wanna keep, keep that in mind um, when placing your order. We will then move on over to the pho bok soup shop. If you like pho or pho, then you will want to try the pho, pho bok soup shop. Um, it's a fun restaurant and it serves really amazing bowls of pho with slow cooked um, chicken and slow cooked short ribs in, in deliciously rich broth. It's hard to beat. We will then move on to the Hong Kong, A plus Hong Kong kitchen. Um, it's without a doubt the best place to get Hong Kong Cafe Eats in Seattle. The spot serves up a lot of incredibly delicious dishes and tasty drinks. But one of the things that you're definitely gonna wanna try is the mango and coconut sago for dessert. And this is an Asian inspired tropical chilled treat that combines a creamy coconut tapioca pudding and sweet tangy chunks of fresh mango. And it's really refreshing and very delicious. Moving on, another spot that you want to check out is Milky Milky. And it is a dessert cafe that brings Korean street food to Seattle. They have tons of skewers and other popular Korean dishes. But what they're really known for is this popular Bing Su dish that I have pictured here. Bing Su is a Korean shaved ice dessert and it has sweet toppings on top that will include um, fruit or condensed milk, fruit syrup, red beans. This is mango. This is strawberry in the background. Um, really interesting, different, but definitely worth trying. And finally, I'm going to talk about Hood Famous Cafe. You're going to find a large array of really delicious Filipino treats at Hood Famous Cafe. This um, ube cheesecake is definitely worth trying. They also have coffees that have ube in them, um, pandan lattes, durian white chocolate mochas. Um, but this bright purple ube cheesecake is um, a real treat that would, is, worth, is worth tasting. Finally, um, in the downtown area, we're going to head to West Seattle. West Seattle is an often overlooked part of Seattle, and it offers one of the few destination beaches on Puget Sound. So to get to West Seattle, there are a couple ways you could do it, but I'm gonna recommend taking the water taxi. You can start from Pier 50, which was one of the piers that was in the picture on the backside of um, Pike Place Market. Um, and you take the water taxi from Pier 50 and it lets you off at the Seacrest Station, uh, which is in West Seattle. Well, before you head to the beach though, you're gonna wanna stop in at the Marination Mock High Patio. It's um, one of the Marination Station um, uh, locations in the city. And there you can grab these tacos and they are a Korean Mexican taco mashup and they are delicious. Um, so you'll wanna grab those and then head over to Alki, Alki Beach. Alki Beach has a two and a half mile long pedestrian walkway. And in the summer, it's populated by beach volleyball players, sun worshipers and beach comers. Most of the beaches on Puget Sound are covered in rock and shells. But as you can see here, Alki has a sandy beach and it has great skyline views. There's also the Alki Point Lighthouse, which is one of eight lighthouses on Puget Sound that's open to the public. And so you, if you are into lighthouses, you can stop in there. It was built in 1913 and um, is still maintained by the Coast Guard. It's full of old instruments, photographs, and charts of the Puget Sound. So from Alki Beach, I'm gonna let Mike take over and we will move into some of the neighborhoods that are worth visiting that are outside the main downtown area of Seattle. Thanks, Susan. Okay. 
So Seattle, like Chicago, is a city of neighborhoods, and there's really a lot to do in them. Um, the first couple of neighborhoods I'll discuss are Queen Anne and Magnolia, and these can be found northwest of downtown Seattle. If you look at the, the map here, this little orange dot or pin on the map is the Space Needle, and Susan talked about that already. So we'll be picking up it with the green push pins um, from there. So the first neighborhood I'd like to talk about is Queen Anne, and it's typically divided into two segments. There's Lower Queen Anne and there's Upper Queen Anne. And as you kind of walk up or drive up the 450 foot tall hill overlooking downtown, you're entering Upper Queen Anne. It makes sense, right? Uh, interestingly, Seattle has just officially branded Lower Queen Anne to be named Uptown. Uh, I guess that sounds more, more hip and inviting. But uh, the Upper Queen Anne is more <clears throat> residential and upscale, and the Lower Queen Anne is more uh, vibrant, and, and there's a lot of energy down there. Um, and I think a lot of the Amazon employees who, who moved there after they opened up the headquarters in, in uh, Seattle kind of end up in Queen Anne and, and that sort of area. So prices have gone up in terms of real estate for them, which is uh, something that locals that have lived there for a long time uh, really bemoan, understandably. So uh, what we're looking at with the Queen Anne, if you uh, take a look on the right side of the screen, we have Cary Park. And Cary Park is perhaps the, the most iconic vista of the city that you're going to find. Uh, this photo at the top in the upper right shows the crowd that's gathering at sunset to try to get a, a nice image of the skyline. And it's really a nice vantage point. And you can see the kind of photograph you can take um, in the, the lower right-hand corner when, it, when it's past sunset and the lights are at it. It's, it's really gorgeous. Uh, one of the, the places that you want to check out if you're in Uptown uh, is Dick's Drive-In. This is a local institution. People flock to this burger joint uh, because of the food, which is similar to In-N-Out Burger, but Dick's is also notable for treating their employees really well, and part-timers receive college tuition assistance after just six months on the job. So they're they're very conscious of of what they have in their employees and uh, and sort of reward them for that. So um, as we move to the west of Queen Anne, we're going to start to get into Magnolia. And Magnolia is known for one thing, uh, and that is Discovery Park. Otherwise, Magnolia is a fairly residential neighborhood. It's been there for a long time. But at the tip of it is this amazing park, one of the, the largest ones in the city that has uh, great hiking and some of the views at sunset are really nice. Um, you may have, uh, if you're a fan of, of grunge music, you may have heard the song Hunger Strike by Temple of the Dog. And that was filmed here in Discovery Park. And it featured Pearl Jam's Eddie Vedder and the lead singer from Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, who recently passed away in 2017. Um, and that the, the lighthouse is featured in that music video. So it's a, a great place to get close to the Puget Sound and to experience the water as well as uh, some great hiking. The next neighborhood I'd like to talk about is across the water uh, to the north, and that's called Ballard. So we're, we're moving across the Lake Washington Ship Canal. And I'd say Ballard is notable for four things, probably. The Ballard Locks, which are along that Lake Washington Ship Canal, the Golden Gardens Park, uh, a fantastic walkable downtown, and its prop 
It's a very popular brewery district. So first up is the Ballard Locks. As I mentioned, this is one of the first things you're going to want to do in Ballard. It's the Hiram M. Chittenden Locks officially, but people locally call it the Ballard Locks. Um, the function of this is to sort of isolate the fresh water of Lake Union to the east from the salt water of the Puget Sound. And the Puget Sound is also 20 feet lower in elevation as compared to the lake. So uh, there has to be a lock system kind of to, to get ships on the proper water level. 40,000 vessels pass through the locks every year, making it the nation's, the nation's busiest lock system. And perhaps the coolest thing about the Ballard Locks is the fish ladder. You can go below street level and check out the, uh, the salmon swimming upstream. And most of this activity happens in the summer. So you may be lucky enough to see this if you're there at the right time. So for sockeye salmon, the peak viewing period is in July. And Chinook salmon, they come in the last two weeks of August. Coho salmon are in the last two weeks of September for the peak viewing. And if you ask Seattle locals where the best place to watch a sunset is, Golden Gardens Park is going to be in their top five answers. At sunset, you can find groups of people building fires by the water and enjoying the moment. And during the day, you'll find a nearby grove of trees, which is perfect for hanging a hammock and letting the world just drift by. You can see photos of those, those trees that are the right size to tie your hammock on and people gathering by the water there. So Ballard Avenue uh, is host to something very special and that's the Sunday Farmer's Market. It takes place in the heart of the neighborhood and it's open year round. And it's been a beloved local institution since it first opened in 2000. And in fact, Ballard Avenue and all the nearby streets are really great spots for strolling and eating outdoors. Um, the photo in the middle that Susan took, um, or at the right rather, shows that there are wooden pergolas along this stretch of the avenue to shelter diners during this COVID crisis when everybody's dining outside. So it's really the ideal way to weather the pandemic storm. And in general, you, if you do travel to Seattle relatively soon, um, they are instituting things like uh, mask mandates and uh, proof of vaccination in some cases for going into restaurants. So just be prepared for that if, if you happen to travel soon. So in, the, in this sort of downtown district, I'd like to point out just a couple of restaurants that you might want to try. The first up is called Sawyer, like Tom Sawyer. Uh, it's a casual new American spot. It specializes in kind of upscale comfort food. You might try their fried butter chicken with curry sauce or maybe the spicy tuna crudo. Another must try in this area is the walrus and the carpenter. It's a raw bar and it has several varieties of oysters, most of which are local to the Washington state. Ballard is perhaps known throughout Seattle and really the Pacific Northwest as a great place to get delicious craft beer. The, the brewery district actually has uh, about a dozen breweries or so in a very, small number of square blocks. They take their beer very seriously there. And you're likely to be able to try traditional favorites as well as clever new takes on old standards. One place that you might consider going is called Rubens Brews. It's a neighborhood fixture that really helped to solidify Ballard as the craft beer center of Seattle. You can sample several lagers, sours, West Coast IPAs, hazy IPAs, stouts, and porters. To the east of Ballard is a neighborhood called Fremont. And it's really the free-spirited and counter-culture capital of Seattle. It's 
Seattle's answer to the hate Asbury district of San Francisco, really. It's notable for a few things, not the least of which is their public art. For example, the Fremont Troll, which you can see in the upper left, sits under an underpass and features an authentic Volkswagen Beetle clutched in its uh, hands or claws. The Troll has been a popular destination for locals and tourists alike since it was created in 1990. Other notable public art in Seattle includes the Fremont Guidepost, which is a street sign themed work, which graphically illustrates how Fremont considers itself to be the center of the universe. You'll also find the Fremont Vintage Mall close by, uh, which is kind of like a, a flea market sort of thing. It's got several vendors that share space in this building, and it has a very eclectic vibe. You might find an Eames lounge chair a few paces away from Star Wars memorabilia, which is just down the row from Bart Simpson t-shirts. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff here. It's, it's kind of random, but that adds to its charm, I think. You may have noticed a delicious aroma wafting around in the air as you're wandering the streets of Lower Fremont, and that's because of Theo Chocolate, which is housed in a former trolley barn. Theo is famous among Seattleites for their confections, which would make excellent souvenirs for the folks back home. They were the first fair trade organic certified cocoa producer in the United States. Now, surely you've worked up an appetite with all the walking. Uh, so one of the best sandwiches in the whole of the city can be found in Fremont at a restaurant called Paseo. And the sandwich to get is the Caribbean roast pork. Uh, there's a rival sandwich place in Ballard called Un Bien, which is actually supposedly working with the original recipe for, for the Paseo sandwich. You could try them both and pick a team. And uh, either way, I'm sure you'll have a great sandwich because they're both very good. If you're looking for something a little more upscale, there's a restaurant called Eve Fremont. It's a farm to table spot and it places the emphasis on the quality of their ingredients. And the spirit of Fremont's hippie past is sort of present in this restaurant. A lot of the preparation have uh, seeds and ancient grains added to them to enhance them. And the end result is, is delicious. The, this is the favorite restaurant of one of Susan's friends who lives in Seattle. To the southeast of Fremont, you'll see uh, Lake Union, which is a great central, centrally located lake just north of downtown. It's east of Queen Anne and southeast of the neighborhood we just visited, Fremont. There's a lot going on here at Lake Union. The first thing you'll want to check out here is Gasworks Park which is the photo in the center. So you'll see these large industrial steampunk looking structures near the waterfront. And this is actually the site of the Seattle Gas Light Company, which turned coal and later oil into gas to light the city. The plant was closed in 1956 and ultimately was turned into a park in 1976. It features Kite Hill, which aside from the obvious uses, is a spot that locals uh, like to take advantage of for sledding on those rare snow days that they have. So as you wander through Gasworks Park, you'll probably notice seaplanes taking off and landing on the lake. These planes are available to give you a flying tour of downtown Seattle and beyond. You can charter uh, a plane for a 20 minute scenic flight for $120 at Seattle Seaplanes. As you fly over the lake, you'll see a number of houseboats moored to the docks on the shore. These houseboats are a much desired but rare housing option in Seattle. The maximum number of houseboats is capped at a little, a little over 500. If you have a keen eye, you might spot the Sleepless in Seattle houseboat from the air or the water. Another interesting uh, 
way to get onto the water in style is a hot tub boat. <laughs> These boats are steered with a little joystick like a video game. So pretty much anybody could, could steer one. They allow you to float on Union in relaxing comfort. I'd say the best time to do something like this is probably in the late spring or early fall when there's a little chill in the air and you'll really get the benefit of that hot tub. Uh, these have been very popular on social media platforms like TikTok. Uh, and if you'd like to book one, you're looking at about $400 for two hours. Another way of getting onto the water is via this institution called the Center for Wooden Boats. It's found at the southern shore of the lake, and they offer free one-hour rentals of rowboats Wednesday through Sunday on a first-come, first-served basis. The next area I'd like to talk about is to the northeast of the lake, and that is the University District. This area is tailored towards students, so you'll find a lot of youthful energy and inexpensive food. But let's talk about the University of Washington first. This is a gorgeous campus. It finds its way onto the lists of the most beautiful college campuses in the United States. And I'd say this is due in part to its natural setting near the water. Uh, but also because of its neo-Gothic architecture and its really beautiful landscaping. The landscaping uh, is perhaps best highlighted in the Liberal Arts Quad, where there's a large stand of cherry trees, which blossom every year, making for a really magical look. Another spot to check out on campus is Rainier Vista, which is a place designed to allow for unobstructed views on clear days, of Mount Rainier. And finally, you may want to check out the ASUW Shell House, which was home to the rowing team, which competed for gold in the 1936 Olympics. It certainly plays a sizable role in the popular nonfiction book, The Boys in the Boat. So nearby the University of Washington, you'll find a lot of great food. And this is the sort of bang for your buck that uh, it can be hard to find in a big city, but you could do a lot worse than the university district for, for this kind of value food that's very good still. Many of the most popular places are found on University Way Northwest, which is known to locals as simply the Ave. One of the great choices on the Ave is a restaurant called Thai Tom. You can see a photograph to the left of the screen. It's known for its excellent pad thai, but you're unlikely to go wrong with any of its uh, food options. And there's an open kitchen there so you can see everybody uh, making your food for you. It's, it's very cool. Now we can't really talk about cheap food in Seattle without discussing teriyaki, at least for a moment. So Seattle has its own take on teriyaki chicken which is sweeter than the traditional varieties that you'd find in Japan. It's kind of the unofficial fast food of Seattle, much like Italian beef sandwiches are for Chicago. You can fi find teriyaki all over Seattle. Uh, it's literally, literally everywhere. But if you go to Toshi's Teriyaki, which is east of campus, you're in luck because Toshi Kasahara is the man who invented or, or created the Seattle teriyaki scene back in 1976. You might also consider eating at Little Duck, which is a bit west of the Ave. Little Duck specializes in food of uh, the Northeast region of China. You might try their string beans, which have been uh, stir fried or the double cooked pork slice. The food is reportedly great and the prices are reasonable for what you get. If you're looking for a historic dive bar, the U District has you covered there too. The Blue Moon Tavern, which is temporarily closed due to the pandemic, has hosted some elite guests from Dylan Thomas to Allen Ginsberg and Tom Robbins. Also the grunge band Nirvana hid out their in-store record signing to get away from their fans uh, when they were signing Nevermind albums. If your tastes are a little more upscale, 
check out the Mountaineering Club, which is a great rooftop bar near the Ave. The next place I'd like to talk about is the Washington Park Arboretum. It's across the water from the University District uh, to the south. So the Arboretum, as you might imagine from the name, has a lot of great trees and foliage to check out. It's a 230-acre site, and you'll quickly forget you're inside the city limits as you soak in the peaceful nature here. One of the most popular spots in the Arboretum is the Japanese Garden, which is conveniently, which conveniently has a large parking lot nearby. So if you're feeling adventurous though, you can reach the Arboretum from the water. You can rent a kayak from the Agua Verde Paddle Club, which is near the university, and make the journey to the Arboretum through lily pads, and you can check out herons and turtles along the way. It's really a, a unique way to experience the site. And a round trip journey from the Agua Verde Palo Club takes about an hour. That doesn't include the time that you might spend uh, cruising around the Arboretum, of course. And the rentals cost 20 to $30 an hour. So it's not too expensive. After wandering the grounds of the Arboretum, uh, you could head south to Cafe Flora for a bite to eat is generally considered to be the best vegetarian restaurant in the city. The dining room brings the outdoors indoors with plenty of plants to add to the atmosphere. And the final neighborhood I'd like to talk about is Capitol Hill. This is a diverse and bustling neighborhood that has a lot going on. It's known for its nightlife, but you can find something to do there in the day for sure. So I'll group my discussion of Capitol Hill into three parts, Volunteer Park, Cal Anderson Park, and the Pike Pine Corridor. And if you look on the map here, uh, the upper section here is Volunteer Park. And then you have Cal Anderson Park, which is kind of uh, lower middle. And then the Pike Pine Corridor is at the bottom here. Volunteer Park is part of the Olmsted Brothers plan for Seattle, Seattle's park system, which they submitted in 1903. And one of the great features of the park is the Seattle Asian Art Museum. This 1933 gorgeous Art Deco building was the original home of the Seattle Art Museum. And they moved to a downtown location, which Susan showed you before. They've recently uh, completed a multi-year renovation of the Asian Art Museum space, which they completed just in time for the pandemic to hit. Its space celebrates all manner of Asian art and is one of the most important collections of its type in the country. It's currently open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And in front of the museum, you'll find Black Sun, which is a 1969 sculpture by noted artist and designer Isamu Noguchi. Inside the park, you'll also find the Volunteer Park Conservatory, which was built in 1912 in the Victorian style and sort of modeled after London's Crystal Palace, constructed about six decades earlier. The conservatory has been closed due to COVID until recently when it reopened. So if you're going for a visit, it might be open for you. And finally, I'd like to mention that Lakeview Cemetery is just to the north in this park area. It's notable for being the final resting place of Bruce Lee and his son, Brandon. Thousands of visitors each year come to this site to pay homage to this martial arts legend. So moving a few blocks south, we come to Cal Anderson Park. While it's not as flashy as Volunteer Park, Cal Anderson Park arguably plays a more important role to the residents of Capitol Hill who use it as a gathering spot. It's a great place to people watch, as you can see from the photo here. Um, as many of you are aware, Seattle has been in the news at least a year ago um, due to some protests that surrounded the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. For a couple of weeks, Cal Anderson Park was a key meeting place 
for this area, which they called CHOP, the Capitol Hill Organized Protest. It was a self-described autonomous zone in which residents organized protests and actually disallowed the police from entering. It was disbanded by the mayor after a couple of weeks due to some violence. Over a year later now, there's little trace of the events in the park, but for local residents, it's a memory which won't quickly go away. Near the park is a much less controversial place and perhaps the premier bookstore in all of Seattle called Elliott Bay Book Company. It's a huge temple to the printed word and is really well known for its author readings. And finally, we come to the thriving heart of Capitol Hill. It's the Pike Pine Corridor. And it's named after the two main east-west thoroughfares, which are a block apart. And yes, this is the same Pike Street, which spawned Pike Place Market to the west. Some of the coolest restaurants in Seattle can be found in, in Pike Pine. If you have a taste for Middle Eastern food, for example, you'll want to check out Mamnoon. A lot of the inspiration for the dishes here comes from Syria. You'll love the bakery in front of the restaurant, but the, the main focus of the food is on metze or small plates. And uh, for dessert, you may get the urge to try some ice cream in Seattle. You're in luck because they have some great options here. The first one is salt and straw, which is the favorite ice cream of many Seattleites. It's known for its inventive flavors, some of which are seasonal. Um, and if you want to get something a little bit different or just are, or are just curious as to how good vegan ice cream can be, you'll want to check out Frankie and Joe's. Like salt and straw, they aren't limited to merely chocolate and vanilla. Their plant-based ice creams include things like mint brownie and salty caramel ash. I thought that one sounded particularly interesting. Uh, there is, <laughs> there's a cat cafe in uh, the Capitol Hill area too called Neko Cat Cafe. So that's something you might consider doing if you're uh, a cat lover. Um, I believe that, that they're available for adoption and um, it would be an interesting thing. That's, it's very popular in Japan, but less so here in the States. And finally, if you're in the mood for coffee, make sure to check out Starbucks Reserve Roastery. Now, Chicago recently opened one of these on Michigan Avenue, and these immense spaces proudly display their roasting equipment and feature specialty coffee drinks unavailable at your neighborhood Starbucks. Each Starbucks reserve roastery is laid out a bit differently. So even if you visited the Chicago one, you may want to take a, a stop at the one in Seattle as well. So this concludes my trip around Capitol Hill and in fact, all the neighborhoods that I'll be covering and wraps up the prepared content that Susan and I have for you. But we'd really love to hear any of your experiences of Seattle. And of course, we're happy to take any questions that you might have. There was a question um, in a comment about the safety of Seattle and whether we'd been there recently and how safe it was. And I was there in August, middle August, and did not feel at all concerned for my safety. We walked from our hotel, we walked all over Seattle and um, it felt completely safe. Um, I, there has been discussion about a, a large homeless population there. Um, we did see uh, a parking lot near our hotel where there was kind of a tent city, but um, we're surprised really that there was not a, a larger presence of homeless people. We see more of homeless people in downtown Chicago than we saw walking around Seattle. And never once was I concerned for my safety. I even walked at night from our hotel to this um, space needle by myself without a concern. So that, that wasn't uh, an issue at all. And th the other thing I forgot to mention was how hilly Seattle is. It really, it has hills that rival San Francisco hills. They are very large hills. And so when you look at the map and you see that Pine or Pike Street can take you all the way down to Pike Place Market and over to Capitol Hill. Um, 
you have to know that that includes some really steep hills. So um, it looks like you can walk it, but you may not want to. So <laughs> take that take that into consideration. That's a good point. Any other questions? Have any of you visited Seattle? And Jeff Bezos. Uh... Um, I'm just trying to see here if I'm on. You're on, we can hear you. Okay, oh, great. Um, I visited Seattle a number of years ago and I just wanna mention a museum that I did visit that was fantastic. It's the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience. Oh. Okay, de just for your, um, your audience to know that, that was very worthwhile. And um, how do you feel about um, the mass transportation there? Would you recommend uh, renting a car or do you think the areas that you discussed, especially outside of the city that Mike talked about, that um, we could use mass transportation or do you need a car for that? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we had a car when we were there and so we used it. So I did not use mass transit. Um, the problem with having a car is you have to find a place to park it. And that was a problem. So I think, um, I would recommend mass transit. Um, you can get, the, they have a light rail that goes from, connects the airport to downtown. And then they have a really, it, it seemed like a pretty um, extensive, uh, tr you know, city transportation system as well. So, so I, I would recommend that over, rent, over renting a car and, and having to deal with it because um, finding a place to park was not easy in, a, uh, in most of the locations that we have discussed and trying to figure out how to park. It was, you know, it, it just was a little bit harder. Um, they do have those electric scooters that you can rent and that we did do that one day just to get around the, the kind of the downtown area. Um, we did it where there were no hills and that was a really kind of fun way to get around. The, the thing about the light rail system in Seattle, which is new and, and very clean and safe and that sort of thing, is it, it's basically just one long line right now. And as Susan mentions, it, it goes from the airport to downtown, but it also, uh, they, they have a stop um, in Capitol Hill and then across the water, they have one near the football stadium in the University of Washington. And I think they just opened one or two more. So it's gradually extending north, but that doesn't really help you get east and west very well. So but Ballard, they have this they have the subway and they've got the the buses too. The buses are, are yeah. very well developed. But but like Ballard, um, which is to the northwest of downtown, can be a little difficult to get to. It's it's a little bit isolated uh from from at least the, the light rail and that sort of thing. And parking is is an issue. So, I mean, something like Uber might be something you consider or um, an alternative like that. Um, and then we did have a comment that um, one of our guests took the Amtrak Empire Builder from Chicago okay. and said it was a really great trip and also recommended the Seattle Art Museum. And they liked riding the subway and the monorail. They took public transportation for two days and it was fine. So oh, awesome. Um, great, great feedback. I think that the train from Chicago sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions or comments? Well, Susan and I are, are grateful that you took some time to spend with us this evening. And uh, if you think of any other questions you have, please feel free to email one of us. Uh, we'd be happy to get back with you. And we will be uh, posting this video later in the week or, or possibly early next week. Uh, so look on our website for that. I, in the chat window, I put a link to the program spot. And we'll also be sending out um, the slides for this program as like a PDF. I think we'll probably do that tomorrow. So look for those and as well as a survey, a brief survey that we'll ask you to complete. Any parting thoughts, Susan? No, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was fun. Seattle's a great place to visit. 
And uh, now that things are opening up more, it's uh, definitely worth taking a trip out west. Thank you. Thanks, Great guys. Job. Thank you.